Hi, this is Erin Johnson, Outstanding Ohio's Most Resourceful Realtor, and I am here today with another Resourceful Realtor Thursday. Today we're going to be talking about strategies buyers can use to try to win in multiple offer situations, which in this market, we're spring of 2021 here in Northeast Ohio, is fairly common, unfortunately, for the buyers. It's a great market to sell. Um, but for the buyers, it can be a frustrating experience because there's a lot less houses on the market than there are buyers, which means the decent houses are getting multiple offers in a matter of hours or days, and they may get two, three, four, five, even ten offers on one house, which means only one buyer can get it. And uh, so that's why I'm going to share with you some things you can be thinking about how to make your offer more attractive to try to win in these situations. Okay, so uh, there's actually 10 things and there's different levels you can do for each thing. So bear with me, I'm gonna to try to talk through all of these. The first one is the amount you pay. And in this market, we're, we're here in uh, 2021, spring of 2021 in Northeast Ohio. I think it's similar across the country, but um, you're probably gonna to have to offer asking price at a minimum. Now that's a caveat is that's assuming that it was, you know, priced within some realm of reason, have your realtor help you look at comps and, and make sure of that, make sure it wasn't grossly overpriced. Don't just assume because of the asking price that it's worth that much, but most cases it is. Uh, and second caveat is if it's been on the market a while, you may be able to get away with offering less than asking price. Uh, but if it's, if it's a decent house that's been updated and priced relatively well, you're probably going to have to offer asking price at a minimum. But several other people may be offering asking price or more. Uh, you should consider offering more than asking price if you can, and also consider an escalation clause that would offer a maximum price that you're willing to go to if you need to. So those only come into play if there's multiple offers. You don't, you don't offer that if there's not multiple offers. Excuse me. And it would only be enacted if there was another offer to escalate against. So for example, if the asking price was 250,000, you could say, my offer is 255,000, but I am willing to go as high as 270,000 by an increment of $2,000 more than the next highest bid. So if somebody comes in and bids 260,000, your offer would become 262,000. And they have to show you proof of that offer in order to, to have you do that. So that's giving you some wiggle room to go higher and so you don't lose and then be like, oh, well, you know, we, maybe we could have gotten a couple thousand more, um, but you're also not just giving that money up front in your offer. You're saying, here's really what I wanna pay, but if I have to, I'll go up to this and you'll have less regret. If you lose at that price, okay, somebody wanted it for 275 or 300 or some crazy number, then you have to be okay with that. It's like, what's your walk away price? Just give that up front as a max in your escalation. Okay, so that's the first thing, price. Basically, offer as high as you can in an escalation if you can. Um, but definitely have the frame of mind that you're probably going to have to pay asking or more than asking in order to win the bid. The second factor of the price is how you're going to pay for it. So typically, a lot of people are getting loans, right? And there's different types of loans that may be viewed differently. A conventional loan is probably the most favorable. And then there's also the lender the lender who you're planning to get the money from, and actually the mortgage officer, the mortgage loan officer that's working on your, your loan can be an important factor. And here's why. Because some don't have the best reputation at actually getting the loan to go through. Maybe they said they were pre-qualified and when they dig into the details, they couldn't actually get the loan for that amount. And they also don't necessarily make the deal happen and close on time, which is a big deal. So you want to pick a lender that has a reputation for being good at getting the deal done and getting it done on time. And realtors are aware of that. So if you're between different offers, as you're looking at different offers, that is gonna come into play. So if you're not sure, if you're working with a trusted and reliable lender, ask your realtor, consider switching. It's, it's worth it to switch to somebody that the realtors recognize as being reliable because that is, uh, can and does come into play. But of course, I think the most uh, attractive thing from a seller is if you come in with cash. If you do have the means to pay cash, that is always going to be more attractive than somebody coming in with a loan. It just takes one more element of risk out. You don't have to worry about if the, lo if the loan's gonna go through. 
you don't have to worry about the house appraising. That is big, especially as these prices go up and up and up. Uh, it doesn't have to appraise if it's with cash. So cash is king, but short of having the cash, make sure that you are pre-approved. That's, that's a minimum. You need to be pre-approved. Have that proof. If you can prove your funds for your down payment, the higher the down payment you have, the more uh, serious you look and, and reliable and, and go with a trusted lender. The third piece is earnest money. So earnest money is that kind of good faith money you give up front to say, I'm serious about this. And standard is like 1%, maybe 2%, a uh, few thousand bucks. But uh, in this market, if you can up that amount, it just makes you look a little more serious. And then to really uh, make it more attractive, you should consider making that amount non-refundable, which means if you back out of the deal for any reason, which would typically be something happening in inspection or maybe something happening with your loan, you would not get that money back. That's signaling to the seller that you're very serious and not very likely to back out of the deal if you can at all control it. So um, that's definitely more attractive to the seller. If you can make it non-refundable, the higher amount you can make non-refundable, the better. Uh, if, you can't make, if you're not willing to make it non-refundable, even just making that amount higher is just showing some level of you're being more serious about it. And then the last piece when it comes to the money portion of it is closing costs. Um, you know, it's not untypical historically for the buyer to ask the seller to pay some or all of their closing costs. Typically that happens as a way to kind of loop the closing costs into your loan. And if you don't have that cash to pay that money up front, from a seller's standpoint, they need to look at it as if you offered $255,000 and asked for $5,000 of closing costs, it's really like you offered $250,000. But with that being said, if you're asking for 255 with paying for closing costs and somebody else offers 255 without paying for closing costs, which one do you think they're going to pick? So there are probably other people you're going to be competing against that are not going to be asking for closing costs and you should be aware of that. Uh, so if you can pay your own closing costs, that's best. If you want to go one step up from that and offer to pay some or all of the seller's closing costs, that could make it even more attractive to them. Okay, the uh, fifth thing, fifth and sixth have to do with timing. So there's two key pieces of timing with a real estate deal. It's when are you going to close and when are you going to take possession. Historically, that happens oftentimes on the same day. So close means you sign all your paperwork, the deal's official, and the seller gets the money. The money trades changes hands. And possession means you get the keys and can go into the house and start living in the house. And um, depending on the seller's situation, so let's assume the house is occupied, they may uh, want some wiggle room and some flexibility to uh, move out of the house. So you may offer three days, let's say, past closing for them. They could live in the house three more days before they have to give you the keys and that'll give them time to move out and, and get everything out and cleaned and whatnot. If you wanna go one up from that, you could give them a week, you could give them 10 days, you could give them up to 60 days if you're giving a loan. If you're, if you're getting a loan, you can go up to 60 days. After that, the, uh, the bank's not gonna like you because you need to actually take possession and live in the house within 60 days to do a loan. If you're, if you're doing cash and you wanna give them six months, you can do that, but you know, within reason here. So uh, it really depends on the seller's situation. So if they don't already have another place to go, or they do, but it's not gonna be ready for another month, they would really value having an extra 30 days to stay in the house and not have to go rent and move twice and all that stuff. So you need to understand the seller's situation to see if this is a, a factor worth negotiating and coming into play. If it is, you can, again, I'm gonna tell you historically how things have happened that it wouldn't be uncommon to charge a rent back in that situation. Hey, seller, you can stay an extra 30 days, but I'm gonna charge you $1,500 for those 30 days or a couple hundred bucks a night, something like that. And some people may still ask for that if, if they're offering that additional possession time, but there may be somebody else uh, putting an offer that says, I'll let you do that for free. So that would be, from a seller standpoint, the best case situation if they need that extra time that you give them all the time that they need and you give it to them for free. Again, it, it comes down to what you're willing to do uh, as a buyer, but that is how you can make your, attract, your offer more attractive to the seller. Now, from a closing date perspective, the sooner you close, the sooner they get their cash. So that's always uh, important to the seller, particularly if they're trying to close on another deal. If they can get the cash from their house in order to buy another house, 
the sooner they can get their cash and time that out would be good for them. If you're paying cash, probably the fastest you can close would be like 14 to 21 days, depending on if you're doing an inspection. A standard, if you're getting a loan, would be 45 days. Depending on your lender, you might be able to close in 30 days. So talk to your lender, see if you've got a phenomenal lender, and depending on your situation, maybe you could even close within 21 days. Make sure they're comfortable with whatever you say, you're, whatever you put in the contract, that they're comfortable with getting you closed in that amount of time. Because you don't want to overpromise that you can close in 21 days and then your lender can, can't do it less than 30. But the quicker you can close, the more attractive your, your offer will look to the seller. And that is a, a key piece of things that they'll look at in addition to the price. Okay, the last four things um, are have to do with uh, contingencies. So typically a contract is contingent on a few things. One being inspection. So saying, hey, I'm going to give you this price, but the offer going through is contingent on it passing an inspection. And when you do that inspection, there's oftentimes some negotiation of like, oh, it needs a new window or this needs to happen. And there might be some, um, some price negotiation or some other concessions at that point. That would be standard, right? In this market, some other things you can think about offering that would make your offer stand apart from others is to uh, say, hey, I still want to make this contingent on inspection, but I'm, not, I'm going to do it for informational purposes only. I'm not going to ask for any repairs. Um, or any price concessions or anything, I just wanna know. Um, or you can say, I'm gonna do an inspection and I'm gonna cap any requests at $1,000 or something like that, just so they know there's less risk to them. The most extreme thing you can offer is to waive the inspection. And believe it or not, this is happening. I'm seeing it happen quite frequently in this market and um, it makes me a little nervous. I don't necessarily advise doing this. It kinda depends how desperate you are and what you're level of risk is and of course you really want to take a close look at the house when you're going through it to see your comfort level of, of waiving that inspection but you waive that inspection um, you could move into the house and find some serious issue that you didn't know about that maybe you couldn't see so that there is some risk to that but of course that's very attractive to the seller because that's one less thing that can kind of go wrong to make the deal not go through and that's a big one that um, might typically make a deal fall through so some different level levers on what you can do with inspection. In addition to whether you're going to do an inspection and whether you're going to ask for anything is the timing of the inspection. So if you can, um, you know, I think standard is like seven to 10 days. If you're having a quicker close, you may, you may need to make that happen in like five days or three to five days. You'll want to check with an inspector to see what their availability is. But if you can offer to make that inspection happen sooner in the process, that just gives that seller peace of mind of, okay, now we're past inspection and this deal is going to proceed. Um, so that's another lever that you can play with is how quick you can make the inspection happen. The other uh, contingency that's pretty standard is appraisal. So a lender in particular, if they're going to lend you money, they want to make sure that the house is worth what they're lending you the money for. And if it's not, then they're not going to be willing to lend you that money. So back to our example, if you end up paying, um, maybe you did 255 and you escalated to 270. If you end up with that 270 escalation and the appraiser comes in and says, it's only worth 250, you have this $20,000 gap and the lender's only going to lend you $250,000. So the only, there's like kind of three options on how to solve for that. The seller could reduce their price, which of course they're not going to want to do. You could kind of meet in the middle and maybe they reduce their price a little bit and you come to the table with some extra cash or you have to bridge that gap with cash. So you would have to come to the closing table with an additional $20,000 on top of your down payment so that your loan amount is less than the two fifty. dollars If you have the means to do that and are willing to do that and you know that up front, you can write that as an addendum in the offer and say that you are willing and able to bridge an appraisal gap up to a certain dollar amount. And you may need to show proof of funds that you can do that. But that gives the uh, seller more comfort knowing that this deal is not going to fall apart because it didn't appraise. Especially when they're going for ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars over asking price, the risk becomes a lot higher at those prices that the house might not appraise. This is not an issue if. Um, you're paying in cash, you typically might waive the appraisal altogether, which of course is the most attractive to a seller. Just one less thing they have to worry about as far as the deal going through. 
And then the other contingency that can happen is making the sale, the uh, offer contingent upon the sale of another home. So, hey, I need to, I'm going to offer you $255, but I need to sell my house first. So this, this deal is not going to go through until my other deal goes through. And that's um, not untypical in a standard market to make that to, to make that a contingency. But again, in this market, when you're up against somebody that doesn't have to sell another home, you're gonna be the first one off the table because they don't wanna have to worry about, I have no control over when you can sell your home and how it's gonna sell and so forth. Of course, in this market, it's probably gonna sell fast, but again, when there's multiple offers and they don't all have that, yours is gonna be less attractive. So there are options. Um, talk to your realtor, talk to your lender to try to work around that. If at all possible, I would suggest not making your offer contingent on the sale of another home. Um, if it is, there's, you know, particularly if it's not been listed, if your house has been listed and is under contract, that's, that's acceptable. You know, still not maybe as good as not having that contingency at all, but it's a much more sure deal. And depending on if it's already been through inspection and past appraisals, depending on what level of the process or uh, stage of the process it's in will dictate how comfortable the realtor and the seller may feel about accepting that offer that's contingent on another sale. And of course, the best thing to do would be make it not contingent on the sale of another home. Oh, okay, so that's a lot. That's 10 different things and multiple different levels of things you can do within those uh, levers to try to make your offer more attractive. As many of those as you can do, the better to make uh, your increase your chances of, of getting the, the sale. And um, I wish you luck. If there's anything I can do to help you or consult with you, I'd be happy to do that. If you would like to receive the one pager with all the details and laying this out, you can email me at erin at outstandingohio.com and I will send you the PDF so that you can have this handy chart and think about where on the spectrum you are for each of these things. It's really good to be thinking about these things before you get into that 11th hour of like, oh my gosh, we have to put in the offer and how do we feel about this and what should we do about that? Strategize with your realtor ahead of time with your spouse and, and partner and think about, are we willing to waive inspections? What would that mean? You know, Talk to your lender about how quick they can close. So there's a lot of pre-work that you can do to be ready to pull that trigger when you do find the house that you really want. All right, thank you so much uh, for watching. And uh, again, I wish you luck. If you need a realtor, I'd be happy to help you out. 330-227-4355. Have a great day.